Welcome again to Grace Believers Bible Study. What a day in the neighborhood. I love it. What can I say? Yes, Mr. Rogers. Who said that? You? Yeah, Mr. Rogers. But anyway, today we're just going to have one service. It's potluck. You know, it's probably going to run about an hour and a half. Potluck. Potluck. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, it's food day. We'll have a service. Uh, it depends on how long I'm going to keep this thing. It's not going to go over an hour and a half, so it might even go shorter than that. Depends upon the weather, you know. Depends upon the weather. What about it, Bob? Go shorter. You hungry or something? Anyway, I, I'm glad everybody's showing up. They're gradually staggering in. Coming on in, I didn't mean staggering as in drunken, I meant just staggering on in, in their leisure, you know, moseying in. That's a good, that's a good, good thing. So, as I mentioned just a second ago, I'll say it so people can hear it. Uh, Paula fell, and she hurt herself, and when she walks on it, it oozes blood. So, let's be praying for her, and uh, so that's why she's not here. Carl's not here. You know, I sent out a prayer request for Carl. To everybody. And so the thing of it is, uh, he's in the hospital right now. And the thing of it is, Carl is a very private person. Okay, he is. If you've seen him in here, you probably don't know a lot about him. He's a saved individual. That's exactly what it is. He's always hurting. They've run some tests on his stomach. His stomach has hurt him so bad ever since I've known him. But it's gotten really, 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 really bad. And there's other things that, that has transpired too. Don't get me wrong. But, but the, everything, I think, really revolves around the pain that he's experienced. And uh, so his son's with him, taking good care of him in the hospital and so forth. But I went to visit him. He had a smile on his face, even though he was still in pain. So, okay. so just be praying for the guy. He's in Baptist. But, you know, you, you, know, you really don't want to go visit. He, uh, the fact of it is, that's just how private he is. It, it really is. Not, I'm not to discourage anybody, but that's just what, that's how Carl is. Kind of like Trish. Trish is very private, too, you know. But uh, some of, I'm an open book. I'm just wide open. Well, I try to be private, but Dave puts it on Facebook. Oh, I see Dave all the time. Yeah. yeah. I'm always seeing you on it's there. It's I know. I never post anything. He puts everything up. Well, anyway, would you bow your heads in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we come to you today just thanking you for this opportunity to preach the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, and to learn a little bit more. And maybe someone can be edified in here. If not, it's just re re-announcing some of the terms and, and the things that we know from your holy word so we can study it. And it's just a wonderful thing to have fellowship with like-minded believers as we come into unity of the body. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. You know, number one is unity, right? One body, that's unity. Christ is the head. I want you to go to Ephesians 4 first. The title of this today is... For Christ's sake. For Christ's sake. You know, I do want to ask you something as you go over there uh, to Ephesians 4.32. You know, if you're saved in here, you're saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves. That's what it is. But what have you done for the Lord? What have you done for the Lord? Look, if he saved such a wretched individual as Paul and you and me, what have you done for the Lord who went to Calvary's cross and died such a horrible, agonizing death? Are you just going to keep your mouth shut and not tell somebody about it? How great a Savior you have? How great a God we have that would send His only Son into this world to die? Come on. You just want to keep it to yourself? No. We're not, we're not giving praise and glory to the Lord on a daily basis. I can tell you, we're not. And that includes all of you, including me. I don't pray enough. I pray, but it's not enough. I don't help as many people as I should. You know, we're, we're very good at judgmental things. We see somebody along the street, uh, you know, carrying a, 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 or not carrying necessarily, but pushing a shopping cart that's homeless. A lot of times we'll just drive on by. We ever thought to stop and say, look, hey, can I buy you a cup of coffee? Can I buy you a sandwich? 
something. Humble yourself. You're not any better than that person walking along there. You're not any better than that person locked up behind bars. All people are God's children. We just can't get it through our mind. We think we're a little bit better. I know you don't deliberately think that, but you do. We just do. But anyway, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. And be ye kind one to another. Are we kind one to another? Not always. How come? We don't like the color of their skin. We don't like the way they look. We don't like the way they dress. We don't like this. We don't like that. We're not kind one to another. Tenderhearted. Forgiving one another. That's a big deal. Forgiving one another. That's hard to do. Don't mean you got, yeah, that's a tough one. It don't mean you agree with what they did that upset you in the first place. But forgiving one another is God's way for you to, to, to do things, to live your life, be a good cheer. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. That's what I was meaning right before I read the scripture. Christ, it's for God's sake. Christ hath forgiven you. But how do we have a hard time forgiving other people? Goodness gracious, alive. Yeah, it's just, it's all I can. Go to Psalm 86, please. The book of Psalms. And I really, I could spend a whole hour and a half in the book of Psalms. I'll be very honest with you. I love the things that are written in the book of Psalms. 86. Let's go to verse 5. Excuse me. For thou, Lord, art good. Yes, he is. And ready to forgive. And plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon him. How do you call upon the Lord today in this dispensation? Well, first off, you call upon the Lord because he sent his son into this world to die for you. All of your sins. And he was buried and he was resurrected from the dead on the third day for your justification. How do you honor God today? By trusting and believing. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. That's how you honor God. But then that's just the beginning of things. Prior to that, you're, a belie- you're, a, you're, you're lost. And if you think that you're saved and you really haven't trusted this, you are called a lost believer. Millions of the world are lost believers. You go to these churches, specifically the mega churches. Smaller churches are still lost if they're not preaching the correct doctrine. But the mega churches, and you see somebody, just say, for example, Olive Baptist down here. You drive down there, and you see just cars everywhere. And you may think, they've got it together. That preacher in there is teaching the right thing, or they wouldn't be so many people gathered here. They don't have a clue what the gospel is. They don't have a clue. They're not in the one body. They're no new creatures. I'll say no. They, I'm sure someone is saved in that church, I guess. There's going to be some remnants in all of these churches. Someone is not going to believe the doctrine that that church preaches as they're going to it. They go to it because they grew up in it. Or their mom and daddy was in it, or their friends are in it, and they don't want to leave it. And they're never going to learn a lot. Oh, yes, they love the singing. Well, yeah, say Jim, for example. You know, I was blessed to do Jim's, uh, Betsy, his wife, her funeral service. And Jim knew these guys, and you can tell them who it is. And one of them's a preacher. And they, you're talking about, they've got some beautiful harmonies. They've got albums out. And they sound wonderful, don't they, Jim? <laughs> but I'll be honest with you, the things they're singing is non-scriptural. Non-scriptural. But it's beautiful music. And it tickles your ears. It will lead you down the paths mm-hmm, of unrighteousness. I will tell you that. Mm-hmm. See, these scriptures that we just read, these scriptures we just read, that God is good. You know, little, little children said, God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. Amen. Well, they're right. Little children are right. 
He's ready to forgive, and he has plenty of mercy. God will have mercy upon whom he will have mercy, correct? Upon who? All that call upon him. How do you call? By trusting this gospel right here. Any other way won't get it. I may have said this last Sunday. I, I think I told the Tuesday night class. You know, when I saw Franklin Graham down there in South America, he had like, oh, got 53,000 people in an open stadium. And the caption was, oh, there's so many people down here that trusted Christ. Or that, well, I don't know if they, they used the word trusted. And they said 60, I think 6,800, something like that, got saved tonight. I seriously doubt one got saved. Why would I say that? Because <laughs> Franklin Graham does not <laughs> preach the gospel of salvation. They, they watch this TV commercial. They yeah. preach, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. yeah. And really it boils down to believe on the name of. Yeah. But I, I was telling somebody about that. I had never heard. I, and I went to, and I've told you this before. Some of you haven't heard it. Carol and I went to see Billy Graham in Pennsylvania where the Cincinnati Reds used to play. I mean, Philadelphia Phillies. We went in there and it was, the stadium was packed. And uh, they were very rude to us. They, they wouldn't let me sit in this certain section here. They had it already set up for somebody else. So they made us move. Well, I can get over that. But then it, that altar call that he had, all those people fall, falling down the stadium, you know, just come on down, they'll wait for you. Then he looks in the camera and he says, well, you too at home can be saved. Well, if they can be saved by watching television, how come they couldn't be saved sitting in the stands? It's all a show. It's entertainment. It's all about Filthy lucre, money. It's all about money. I'm telling you it is. I've never, and I went back, I think Scott and I discussed this, I'm not sure, but I've went back quite a few years on listening to the classic Billy Graham's. I don't listen to the whole service, but I have never heard the gospel of his salvation or my salvation ever cross his lips, ever. And then he got in bed with the, the Catholic Church. Okay, over the NIV. Okay, so anyway. So what we're going to do today, we're going to look at what the Bible teaches about salvation and forgiveness. Living where? In this current age of the dispensation of the grace of God. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 2, Paul says this. This is one of his prison epistles. He said, and he's talking to who? Believers. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you. If you have heard of the dispensation. And that's where we're living in. We're in the sixth dispensation from the beginning when Adam was in there in the, in, the, in the garden with Eve in the age of innocence, we've just continually had different dispensations. And now we're in the dispensation of the grace of God, not the dispensation of law as the four Gospels were. Okay? Absolutely not. Now, let's go to Romans 4.25. And I'm going to be going to some of these scriptures over and over for various different reasons to emphasize certain portions of it. And uh, at the time that I need it, Romans. See, what, what we're doing here is studying something. They don't ever do that. Talk to somebody about this, and they're like, well, it's way over my head. <laughs> I know. That's crazy, ain't it? You know, and we've, had, we've actually had people show up in here. And, you know, we've got a lot to learn. We have got a lot to learn. Especially me. But the thing of it is, you have people who will show up in here one time, and this, just like David said, they will say, well, you're, you're teaching on a Ph.D. level. I can't understand where the... No, it's called simplicity of Christ. It's so simple. You're trying to complicate it. Just believe it. As, as I said, it was written on a sixth grade reading level, but today it may be a, a, a first-year college for all I know. I mean, it's, it's just crazy. Okay, Romans 4.25, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, who was delivered for our offenses. Now that's the only part I wanted to read. Who was delivered for our offenses. 
everybody has offenses, trespasses, sins, iniquities. Well, you, you know, I think she's done real good to put it with you. But <laughs> we love you, Dave. Contrary to what Irma thinks, but you know, in First Corinthians fifteen, chapter three, I'm just going to—I'm not going to read the whole thing. It says how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. Well, I had a service up last night. Today. I said, this is going to be a, a pretty good for me today. I don't know, about 9 o'clock, I said, that ain't going to work. <laughs> so I changed it. But it was going into Isaiah 53, and according to the scriptures and the prophecy about what's written here in 1 Corinthians, okay? But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, the Bible says, as Paul wrote, For he, God, hath made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. That's just, that ties, that's pretty close to my favorite verse after Romans 8.1. That's really good right there. Jesus Christ was made sin. He sure was. And you don't have to go here, but it's in Galatians chapter 1. We'll go to Galatians 1, 4 later, but I'm going to go to it right now. In Galatians 1, chapter 4, who, Jesus Christ, gave himself for our sins. Bloody mess he was. Unrecognizable as a human being after they got through with him. But you know, Pilate washed his hands. He got to, I can visualize it. He, wa he got a pot of water, a pan of water, like a pot or something. He can take and wash his hands, and all the people could see him washing his hands. And look, I'm innocent of this man's blood. And what did the Jews say? Crucify him. Crucify him. Mm. And what they did, though, it, it says, let the judgment, be, and this is not the right word, but let judgment be on us and our children. What? That sounds close. Right on it, right? <laughs> Thank you, Scott. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Isaiah fifty three ten. Let's go let's go read that. Isaiah fifty three ten. The scripture says, Yet it pleased the Lord, the Lord God, to bruise him. Who is him? Jesus. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. You know, I'm the one now, because I, and I've, I've mentioned this before, but I've got to tell you again, when I'm reading Isaiah, I know Brother Moore and I, I, when I asked him to explain according to the scriptures of 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, he couldn't. And it's not the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's not Hebrews through Revelation. Those scriptures were somewhere. I believe it's Isaiah 53, and that's what I'm going to believe, and that's what I'm going to teach you. Okay? But, you know, you're not going to find many people that's going to agree with that, and I don't care. I really don't. That's what I see to be the truth, and I can explain why and how I believe that took place. But what's man's part to believe and trust for their salvation? What is man's part? Well, in Romans chapter 3, verse 22, let's go there. Romans chapter 3, verse 22. We have a part. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, of Jesus Christ. Ooh, wee, right there. 
the faith of Jesus Christ that God would raise him from the dead. Unto all and upon all them that believe. See, I see in, in the grace and anywhere else, but specifically in the grace, that a lot of people believe that Christ died for all your sins at Calvary's cross and you're saved. No, that's universalism. The Bible just said you had to believe. Believe and trust sometimes are synonymous. Sometimes they aren't. But even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, to, unto, means to all, and upon all them that believe this gospel of the grace of God. That's, why, that's where you get this righteousness of God from. Christ's sacrifice is to who? To everybody on behalf of all mankind. But it's only applied to them that believe and trust. You know, Christ bought you. He tells you that in 1 Corinthians 6 and 7. You're bought with a price. It's the death of the Lord Jesus Christ who paid for your sins. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. It's nothing to do with me. No, not a bit. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift. That's, that's where religion has a big problem because they believe Jesus died. Yeah. But they have no idea why. You know, so it's just, well, believe, it, believe in Jesus. Believe in you know, Jesus. They lost it totally. No personal commitment or there's no trust. You know what gets me, Dave, is, is, is the thing is, it's a gift. Now, you can't work for a gift. If you do, it's not called a gift. Now, you can go over to Romans chapter 5 and read that again and again and again. You can go to Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. But the gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But it's the gift. I think people don't understand it. It's just like you heard Carol say one time whenever I give my nephew, or great nephew over here, I give him an offender amplifier, a really nice one. And when I give it to him, it was his birthday. And I didn't know it was his birthday. It just happened to be. And he says, what, what do I owe you for it? I said, Leland, it's a gift. You don't pay for a gift. If people could understand that in these churches, I think it would help somebody. It's a gift. You don't work for it. You can't do anything to please God in the flesh. You can't control people with that. That's, That's true. You can't control people with a gift. You want them to work. And tithe, tithe, tithe. <laughs> Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll show you what we just talked about right then again. We just mentioned it in Romans 3.22. It's just to back it up. 1 Corinthians 1.21. Paul wrote this, this pre-prison epistle. He said, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them, what's that? That believe. You've got to believe no matter what. In the sense of trusting. It has to be trusting. Right. As, you're right. Like I say, believing and trusting sometimes are synonymous, but it's not always. But you can believe in vain, and that's what 1 Corinthians 15, 1 is about, or 2. You can believe in vain. Oh, my goodness, my goodness. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. So once a person hears the gospel, now which gospel? There's a lot of gospels. The gospel of the grace of God. The gospel for this dispensation that we're living in. God's the same. Hebrews, I think, 11, 8. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
but he deals with people differently in every age or dispensation. So, once a person hears the gospel of the grace of God, not the gospel of the kingdom, not the gospel of repentance, not the gospel of the circumcision or the gospel to Abraham, but the, the glorious gospel of the grace of God. It says in verse 3, For I, Paul says, For I delivered unto you first of all. How that, now who's he talking to here though? He's talking to these Corinthians, but he's got to be talking to people in the synagogue. And who did he go to first? He went to the Jew first. And also to the Greek. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I received. Where did he get his from? He received it from the heavenly Savior, not Jesus Christ, the Messiah, walking around on the face of the earth in his earthly ministry for those three and a half years. See, <clears throat> most people don't believe that. They do not know that. They absolutely do not know that there's two ministries of Jesus Christ. We just happen to be in his heavenly ministry. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. And where did he get it? According to Galatians 1, 11, and 12, he received it by direct revelation from who? The risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Wow. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, we'll go to verse 13. The Bible says this in verse 13, And you, being dead in your sins, why were you dead in your sins? Because when God told Adam over there, in Genesis 2.17, that you can eat of any tree in the garden, but don't eat of the tree of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. Oh, he would disobey God. Sin came into the world. I don't know what it says. Uh, it doesn't say fruit. Okay. Well, I know what it is, but we, that's another story. Yeah, she said fruit. So we re reiterated. So, the fact of it is, he disobeyed God, and sin came into the world. And that's where, what, Romans 5, 12 comes in. For by one man's disobedience, sin came into the world, and death passed upon all men. Huh, that's a paraphrase, but that's close enough. You got the idea. Verse 13, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he, who? Jesus, quickened, made alive, together with him, having forgiven you, all trespasses. So all of my trespasses, past, present, and future, have been paid for by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh my gosh. Two important truths coming from Colossians 2.13. Two important truths. Saints have been. What does that mean? That's past tense. Once you trust Christ, past tense. All saints now have been forgiven. You can't become a saint unless you trust the gospel of the grace of God up here. Then, forgiveness includes all sins. There's not one that's not forgiven. I've heard people, yes, Jim? Some people simply will not believe that. Well, I know. You know, just think about this. We all came from different denominations, different belief systems. Some of us didn't come from any system. But the fact of it is, just think, and I'll use Scott again and Sylvia, they came from a bondage one. Joe did. Uh, the Catholics did. But, you know, you're under bondage. You can't do this. You can't taste that. You can't do anything, really. But just think of the freedom that you have now, that you know the truth. Absolute Total freedom to do anything you want. And the peace that brings you to it. Yeah, that's what Romans 5 one's about. It's the peace of God that passeth all understanding. It's, it's just, whew, 
Thank God I trusted Christ. It's great. But yet still, people don't want it. It's too simple. I've got to do something to earn it. That's, you know, and that's how our capitalistic system works. You've been programmed. You, if you don't work, you don't eat. You know, I mean, you, you can't pay rent. If you don't get a job, you've got to work to do this. You've got to work to do this. But this is one thing. You don't have to do anything except trust. And that's not of work. Now, all sins. Past, present, and all the ones you're going to do when you live to be 110. Take Bob, for example. Bob's a sinner. He's 90. And if he lives to be 110, he's still going to be a sinner in the flesh. He's had 90 years to build them up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the moment, the moment, the absolute moment that we trusted Christ, God forgave us of everything. Oh, the beauty of the book. You know, I, this is off, but I've got to say it. You know, I was thinking about my friend down in Cocoa Beach. Well, Melbourne area. He's an atheist. And me and him good friends. We talked about it. But I was thinking, you see, I've got some tomato plants. I started them from seeds. And if you've ever started anything from seeds, you know, my tomato plants didn't come up as orange trees or plum trees. They come up as tomato trees. It's just like the human seed, the men and the women. Once that seed is planted and it starts growing, that's going to be a human. It's not going to be a baboon or a monkey or a turkey. Ever. Ever, ever, ever. It's going to be a human being. To me, that eliminate. If somebody would just give it a thought of planting a seed, a plum seed comes up as a plum, not as a crab apple tree. Okay? If people would just see the simplistic things of nature, you would understand that it had a creator, and that creator is God. But that's what it said in Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But we know, Jesus said in John 10, 30, I and my Father am one. We know in John 4, 24, that God is a spirit, and we worship him in spirit and in truth. So Jesus Christ, according to him, we might get to this. I don't know if it's in this lesson or not. But it's, first, it's John chapter 1, verse 14. Jesus came in the flesh as God, really. Now, I'm going to tell you what I think. This, this is not scriptural, but it's... It, see, I believe Jesus Christ was here before. Absolutely. I'm not saying he was Melchizedek, but you can't say that he wasn't. No father, no mother. And then when, it, when those three men was walking over there and talking to Abraham... That was the Lord. That was, the, that was a person in flesh that had to be Jesus Christ. And those other two men went on over to Sodom and Gomorrah. But that one stayed. That was the Lord. And they saw the Son of God in that furnace. Woo! It gave me chills to think about that, but that's true. Just look it up. Just do a search and see, what you, see where you find Son of God first mentioned. That's going to be it. <laughs> do you know the moment you trust Christ as your Lord and Savior you become a saint of God Amen. never ever to be re-forgiven people I, I don't care how good they are how good their intentions are people who do not believe in once saved always saved is lost because to believe that, you have to believe there's something that you can do to lose your salvation. Ain't that right? Yes, sir, Dave. It's, it's almost like a higher order of thinking to realize your position in Christ and that, let that be the motivation for your life. It's a higher order than the thinking of got to eat, got to do this to eat, you know, that survival sort of thing. Absolutely, I agree with you. It absolutely is. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, please. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 7. In whom we have forgiveness. Who is that? 
Jesus Christ in his blood. Then what I say? Forgiveness? In whom we have redemption through his blood. You know, I wasn't reading it or I would have said that. <laughs> the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his, I capitalized H there, his grace is what I put a capitalized H. So God tells us that we have what? Present tense. We have forgiveness of all sins presently. You can take it to the bank. It's more reliable than the FDI. See, more reliable than any government on the face of the earth. <laughs> we have forgiveness according to the riches of his grace. Oh, love it. Now, the words according to. Hmm, it tells us how something is going to happen according to God forgives according to what the riches of Jesus Christ's grace according to his grace God's grace and the riches of his grace where is it found in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that's where it's found you trust this right here this gospel of the grace of God you have the riches of his grace which is eternal life Never, never ending, eternal, infinite, infinity. Okay. It's hard to imagine, but I'm looking forward to it. It's all because of his blood's being spilt for us. That's what it is. God loved us before the foundation of the world, and God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit got together. Jesus said, I'll go. And he did. And he did. Now, Let's go to Romans 5, 20. See, a lot of people don't believe this either. Well, they just don't believe what the Scripture says. This is that license to sin that people tell us we have. They don't, they don't recognize Paul's authority. It's hard for them to see a lot of this. They just looking for it. Well, I see the, the problem is tradition... Uh, I was just telling Dave uh, and, and, and uh, Bob here about a man that I've read a lot of his, I got his library, and I've read a lot of his stuff. And he's got so much wrong. He was a grace believer. But on the other hand, he has so much right. So you've got to be, how can you tell, how can you discern what to believe and what not to? It's because you, you better get into this to find out. Because if you're, and that's what happens in these churches. Uh, the preacher will get up there and, you know, say he went to Liberty University. Oral Roberts University. And he's got that Ph.D. of theology out there on him and or a master's in the, uh, divinity or whatever. And, man, this guy, you never got none of that. Maybe you just finished high school. Maybe you finished college. But the fact of it is, you studied engineering, you didn't study divinity. And you think that guy's an expert. Well, I'm not an expert. And that guy in the pulpit, wherever he's at, is not an expert. Because you're not going to, to be an expert, you pretty well have to have accomplished everything and understand this book. I don't understand the book. I understand certain things of the book, which I deem necessary to give to you guys. But they'll listen, and it's according to tradition, a lot of times, just like Franklin, for example, Franklin Graham, his daddy was Billy, or Roberts, his son, is, is, I don't know if he's still the pastor out there or not, or the, over the school, and it happens like that. Daddy was a pastor, the son becomes a pastor, the grandson becomes a pastor. It, it's kind of like the Bushes that running for president are the Kennedys. You know, father did this, grandfather did this, and we just got a dynasty going on. It's just like, what is it, Swaggart. Swaggart's son's out there preaching. It's just like the old boy up in Chicago right now. Jordan, his son's in Arizona preaching. Nothing wrong with that, as long as they can get the message correct. But I'm thinking Jordan's son pretty well got it together. But the rest of them, nah. 
You got, how are you going to know what's right or wrong if a man, if I'm standing up here telling you some stuff, how are you going to know if I'm telling you the truth? You go to the book and you look at it and you study it. Don't just look at it, open it and study it and then talk to some other people. Other people got a handle on this too. Goodness, 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 goodness. Back to, we never got into this. Verse 20 of Romans 5. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. You can't sin enough that grace won't cover it. No, we ain't going over there yet. But it's just, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. But you don't want to do the things that you did before, even though you're going to do some of them. Because it looked good, felt good, tasted good. Pleasing to the eye, the palate, the physical body, whatever. You're going to do it. And that's what Paul says in Romans 7. What I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, that's what I do. But it's not me that doeth it any longer. It's sin that dwelleth in me. You know, I was going to do something about bringing a brother back into the fold. You know, when we see someone do something wrong, just say, me. So you catch me down at some bar, and I've, I've done picked up this hot-looking chick, okay? That's not a dream. That's possible. Okay, okay, okay. Here's the thing. But now if you saw that, or if I saw Scott doing the same thing, or Forrest or whoever, or Renita. Oh. oh. Well, here's the thing. If the person is saved, you're not supposed to shame him. You're supposed to bring him back into the fold. He's saved. You're supposed to go to him and bring him into the fold. But that's not how it always works. Normally people just crucify that guy with words. They stop wanting him to be around. I don't, they're so judgmental. But yes, they won't look at themselves. They may be doing something similar, not as bad in their mind. But a sin is a sin is a sin in God's eyes. No big ones, no little ones. So, honestly, I, I mean, if you see a, a Christian, Christian, did I say that? If you're a saint of God out who has trusted the gospel, and they're doing something that you just know is absolutely wrong, by God's standards, you need to go to them. You don't need to be out there gossiping, because gossip is one of the things that you need to help the person with. Gossip is mentioned in the scripture right side of murder. Did you know that? Gossip is that fiery tongue. You can't pull it back in and put it in here. You've done said it. Hmm. Anyway. This license to sin. I, I've heard that. I'm just sick of that. A license to sin is whenever you walk the aisle for Jesus, you supposedly, supposedly trusted Christ. And then next week, you've done something, and now they want you to come back up and confess your sins and rededicate your life and let everybody know about it and be exposed in front of everybody. That's not the way to do it. Yes, sir? When uh, Les Felder puts out what he says, is it's not a license to sin. That's what he's trying to say. Just because you've been saved, you shouldn't just go out and have a great time. And... We could. Oh, I have. But we could. We could. I guess it sort of depends on what your view of a great time is. <laughs> if, if you're, I'm going to get it this way. If you are truly saved and the Holy Spirit is living in you, He's telling you what not to do and you better not do what that But you will do against what He says. Yeah, I, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Yeah, don't That's calling grieving the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 4.30. But you've got to see what the second part of that is. You're sealed until the day of redemption. You can't sin enough. 
You will, and you'll grieve yourself. Absolutely. You'll grieve yourself. Knowing it, knowing it ahead of time, you'll grieve yourself anyway. Okay. Where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. The riches of God's grace, my God, you've got to thank Him. They're greater than any depths of sin that you can go to. The riches, the riches, oh. Let's go to Ephesians 4.32 again. Ephesians 4.32 again. I used to watch Brother Moore use the same scripture, not this verse, but a scripture. And now, and the, the thing of it was, he uh, he would use it in a in a service, and then five minutes later he's using the same one again, and five minutes later he's using it again. But he was talking about it in all fit. And be ye kind one to another. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Mm -mm -mm. But it is. Again, the word hath is past tense. You have been forgiven. You don't have to be re forgiven. You should be kind. You should be tender hearted and forgiving because what's the reason why you should be? Because you are forgiven. God forgives because of, and for Christ's sake on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what our title is. Christ loved you before the foundation of the world. And it's his love is the reason he went to Calvary to save you, to pay for your sins, to endure what? Agony, humility. The, un, the ultimate penalty for every sin, death. See, I can't die for your sins. And nobody in this room could die for your sins because we're all sinners. Jesus Christ was the sinless Son of God. Wow. You remember over at Gethsemane, he was sweating, as it were, great drops of blood, right? That's in Luke 22, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And what he said, Lord, if there's any way, let this, pet, let this cup pass from me three times. But there was no other way. That was the man Jesus. Not God, but the man Jesus, okay? You think God forsake his son on Calvary's cross? He did. When all the sins of the world were placed upon Jesus Christ, he turned his back and the Holy Spirit left him. Wow. Holy Spirit left one. One of the tr first time and I guess the only time in history that took place. When he became sin, he did satisfy the justice of a holy God. When Jesus took all the sins, he satisfied that justice that God required. The work of the cross made full payment and atonement for everything that you could ever possibly think or do. But you, again, again, and again, and again, you have to believe. What did Christ do? He proclaimed victory. Victory. And that victory is very apparent, not to us that we saw that, but all those witnesses that saw him after the resurrection he walked around on the earth here for another 40 days. That was the proof that it actually took place. Now, uh, the greatest trade ever. The greatest trade ever. What is that? We've read it. 2 Corinthians 5.21 for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The greatest trade ever. And there's never going to be another time in history that anything that great could take place. Ever. No way. And then on the cross, it is finished. It is finished. If you're a believer and have trusted Christ, 
Are you righteous? Absolutely, you're totally righteous. Now you can be called an heir of God, a son of God, an heir with Jesus Christ, a son of God. There's no other way you can experience that unless you have trusted the gospel of the grace of God. Forgiveness is not, <laughs> forgiveness is having been purged of all sin, cleansed from all unrighteousness. You're either righteous or you're unrighteous. And when you're born, you're unrighteous because of what Adam did. Eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So yes. How many times can you be cleansed from the unrighteousness? One time. That's it. You know, they people put him back up on the cross and he has to die daily. What's your present standing? You have forgiveness and you have the righteousness of God placed upon your account. That's the present possession, the moment that you trust the gospel of the grace of God. That's just a given. You know, a lot of people think forgiveness is dependent upon walking the aisle, being water baptized, confessions, you name it, all these things that you have to accomplish. Okay? No. Our, our forgiveness is the complete the moments that Christ is in you. And how does Christ get in you? By you trusting this gospel. You're placed in Christ, the spiritual invisible body, the church, which Christ is the head of. And we all have unity one with another. And that's why I don't like to see a church, you've got splits over here, and they get mad about that. One people... So there's churches out here that have a difference of opinion. Say a Baptist, for example, or a Methodist. Well, this, this side, they think you've got to be immersed in water totally. This side over here, sprinkling's okay. So you've got to be another section of that group. It's got to be done as an infant. You know, and they can't even get along. They forget the words of the scriptures. They're worried about baptism. And baptism has no effect in this dispensation with the exception of the spiritual baptism of 1 Corinthians 12, 13, where the Holy Spirit does all the baptizing. There is no water in it. Did you know Paul never, ever, ever, ever suggest that we confess our sins? Ever. You know, 1 John 1, 9, you've got to confess your sins. But Paul, who wrote the 13th, he never, ever said one thing about confessing your sins. This is a complete forgiveness program that we're involved in. And it's all based upon what? The finished work of Christ at Calvary. Okay, that's what it is. And he did say this. When he died out there, he said, it is finished. So if Christ himself said, it is finished, what's lacking? Somebody tell me that. There's nothing lacking. If he said it's finished, it's a done deal. Now, it's left up to you to believe and trust it, though. He's not going to force you. Nope. He's going to expose you to the truth. Somebody preached the gospel to you. It may have, somebody may have planted a seed. Somebody else could have come along and and watered that and told them again. But it's God that giveth the increase. There's no human being. You're not a, you're not a, what is it called of that? Soul winner. soul winner. You're not a soul winner. There ain't no soul winners. The soul winner is God. God giveth the increase, okay? Now, let's go to Colossians 1.14. Colossians 114. We've already looked at 13. And the last two words of verse 13, it says, Dear Son, in whom, that's Jesus, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Even the forgiveness of sins. You know, let's look, uh, go, hold on to 
I, I, I'm going to come back there shortly, but go over to Ephesians, if you would, chapter 2. Let's look at that. Oh, we'll get to there. Ephesians chapter 2, I want to read something in verse 1. The moment prior to you trusting this gospel of the grace of God, this is you. And you hath he quickened, made alive, the moment you trust this gospel, who were the moment prior to trusting, dead in your trespasses and sins. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. The absolute moment before trusting this gospel. Wherein in time past, before you trusted the gospel, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, who is Satan. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. If you see someone who is unsaved, I don't care if they go to church or whatever they want to do, if they've never trusted this gospel of the grace of God here, they are a child of the devil. Now, they may be your best friend, it could be your wife, could be your husband, could be your child, but they are a child of the devil. There's no other way to say this. Man, Forrest knows a person that's just a great person, but they're lost. What does that mean? They're a, yeah. See, in 2 Corinthians, as Scott was bringing up, 4, 3, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Their, their minds have been blinded. But there's still a chance for them. They're not out of the picture unless the rapture takes place first or they die first. They still have an opportunity or until they lose their mind first. See, that's something, and that's, that's why we're sealed. We can't lose our salvation. If we get Alzheimer's and you don't even know your spouse, your children, and that happens all the time. I know a lot of that going on right now. They don't even know who their family is. If they have never trusted Christ, it's just too late because the Lord has put somebody in front of them or given them a Bible to read and it's on them, not the Lord. He will put people in front of you you never even dreamed him putting in front of you. And it's up to you to make this gospel known to them. It's up to you. That's a big responsibility. Because I've said over in 2 Corinthians, we all have a ministry of reconciliation. You've got to tell someone about it. Just because you have it, you need to tell someone. Share the gospel. Because that last person is just waiting to be saved so we can have the rapture to go up and meet the Lord in the clouds, in the air, and forever be with the Lord. Now, verse 3 of Ephesians 2, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past. Did you gather that? We all had our conversations. In time past, but time passes before we trusted Christ. The desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love where we, he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you're saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So if you're saved right now, you're sitting together with Jesus Christ in heavenly places on the right hand side of the Father because you are in. Okay. Do what now? I was at a church and I had uh, saw that in the pulpit. I said, let me pray next to that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll do that in a minute. <laughs> we'll do that in a minute. I think, I think what we ought to do is get some of these uh, printed up and pass them out to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> we'll cover that in a minute. We'll cover that. <laughs> Let's go back over to Col Colossians chapter 2. And I want to back up to verse... 13. 
We've been redeemed. That means bought back. But in 13, it says, in 12 it says, giving thanks unto the Father, verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. That's why back in Ephesians chapter 2, we're sitting on the right hand side of the Father. That is in the third heaven. That is the kingdom of God that he is in. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3. This is what we're supposed to be doing, guys. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. But do we do that? Some of us hold grudges. Are you... Are we supposed to forgive other people as Christ forgive us? Absolutely we are. So if Christ suffered the agony that he did on that cross and bled out and all those things, it was unrecognizable as a human being, and he forgive you, you rotten scoundrels like me, our wretched men and women, and we can't even forgive a, a, a fellow human being that's in the body? Come on, something's wrong with you. Goodness gracious alive. Let me see where I want to go. Yeah, I already got it down. Let's go to Acts 13. Acts 13. You know, when Paul started his ministry of salvation, he started it in Acts 13. And so he's telling these Jews in the synagogues this in Acts 13, 38. He says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren. Now I'm going to, well, I, I, I guess I shouldn't, but I will. Men and brethren. He was talking to unbelievers at the time. The brethren I believe that he was talking to was fellow Jews as Paul was a Jew here. You got me? That through this man, that's Jesus Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. First time in Acts through any of Paul's epistles that he mentioned forgiveness of sins. And by him, Jesus Christ, all that believe are justified from how many things? All things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Paul says that forgiveness is a completed work of God. Listen, our work, our salvation is past tense. It's done. It's over. Glory in your salvation. Oh. God deals with his saints as those he's already forgiven. Not that he's going to, and not that you've got to do something to earn his praise again. No. He's already forgiven you. See, when we believed and trusted the gospel of the grace of God, God did something. He baptized us or identified each and every one of us who trusted Christ into Christ's death. So let's go to Romans chapter 6. I, Scott, I told you I'd get there. Romans chapter 6. And we'll start in verse 3. Paul says, Know you not that so many of us that were baptized, identified into Christ, Jesus were baptized into his death. 
We were identified with Christ into his death. That's a, that's a judicial statement. Because we weren't there. But judicially it took place. Verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth, I mean from now on, we should not serve sin. We should not, but we do. I'm going to tell you, you feed the old man, he ain't dead. He was crucified, but he ain't dead. It's who you feed, who you're going to serve. Guarantee you. Let me cut this phone off here. It's bothering me. You feed the old man, he'll stick his head up and he'll roar. I know that from experience. So you try to feed the other one. Feed yourself with the words of God. And it's still hard. There's always a wrestling match going on. The flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. They are contrary one to the other. Just the way it is, I didn't make the rules. That's the truth. Galatians 2.20, please. Galatians 2.20. Can you say this about yourself? I am crucified with Christ. Huh? Nevertheless, I live. That's another judicial crucifixion. Because I still see you. You weren't nailed up to a cross. But it says, I am crucified. Paul wrote this, and this applies directly to you and me. With Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Does Christ live in you? Can someone recognize when they talk to you that Christ lives in you? Amen. I've talked to some people that's so-called saved. I can't tell Christ lives in them. That's, I said so-called say because I don't know. I'm not looking at you. <laughs> and the life which I now live in the flesh, and we're all in the flesh, we're all living a life. I live, I'm talking about personal in I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's all I've got to do. I live by the faith of the Son of God. He's not going to fail me. He's never failed me. I've prayed for things, and guess what? I was lost and never, it was like, it fell on deaf ears. And even when you're saved, you can pray. But if it's, I always pray, if it's the will of the Father, that's what I do myself. God identifies the believing sinner with Christ's death. The sinner becomes so identified with Christ's death that all the merit from his blood is applied to the sinner. And guess what? You're still a sinner in the flesh. And you will be a sinner in the flesh until the day you die. Dead men no longer sin. That's why it says in Romans 6, you've got to reckon yourselves to be dead indeed also unto sin. If you don't, and you're wrestling with this, and you're sinning, and you know you are, as we all do, you've got to reckon yourself to be dead. Christ does not see you in your sin. That don't mean you just run out and start sinning, raping and killing people and murdering them. No. You know better than that. But see, it don't matter what you have done or doing or will do, sin-wise. Sin-wise, Jesus Christ at Calvary's cross completely paid for every sin. It's called the cleansing blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. All you do is just trust what he did for you. 
very simple. You see, this, this gospel here, I don't know why people fight this so much. They fight you when they tell you this. I got to do this and I got to do that. No, you don't. Just trust what it is finished, he said. Trust what he did for you. You know, Paul is our apostle, and people, even though the Bible says that in Romans eleven thirteen, Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles, and I magnify mine office. They don't want to believe that. It's written right there in black and white on my page here in this King James Bible, but people don't want to do it. They'll go back over to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to find the truths for them. There's no truths as far as their salvation is in those four books. Now, there's some scriptures in there I call transdispensational that we make an application to our dispensation. But Paul didn't write those. That's just... Paul proclaims God's forgiveness is what? A finished work of grace by God himself. A present and continuing possession of the believer. It's a possession that's yours. Eternal life. And Paul says, it's total, it's complete. Nothing missing. Inclusive of all past, present, and future sins. That sounds like it. That sounds like we're advocating, you can just go out and do anything you want. We're not advocating that. But you can. But you don't want to. Yes, there's things that you're going to do that you want to do. But we're not just, it's not an open season. It's like, you know, that's why they have seasons out here on duck. And you, you can kill a duck certain times of the year and a deer certain times of the year. You just can't go out and start doing it year round. There's certain times that you will do things that are against the will of the Father. But it's already been paid for. You will feel your remorse no matter how good it looks, tastes, or feels. No. Now, there's five things here that Paul explains how God is justified in providing a complete forgiveness to his saints. Number one. Because Christ died for our sins. Well, that's obvious. Number two, because of the blood that Jesus Christ shed. Number three, it's according to the riches of his grace. And that's Ephesians 4.32. We've read it two or three times. Okay? It's for Christ's sake. It's because Christ became sin for us. And under that, there's two subs. We are made the righteousness of God in Christ. He can't take it back. He will never take it back, no matter how despicable you turn out to be, or I. And we are justified from all things. Thank goodness for that. Paul is where we go to find our for doctrine of forgiveness in this dispensation of the grace of God. And we don't go anywhere else. Now... In Paul's epistles, it's actually where we find some unsearchable riches of Christ. You know, we find this right here. We're not going into it, but we find this. That we Gentiles, us ungodly Gentiles, couldn't be saved. Until this unsearchable riches was given to the Apostle Paul through progressive revelation. Yeah, we didn't have no, no effect in it. That's why he's got the prison epistles. Yes, it is. You know, I know God made these revelations known to the Apostle Paul so he could make these things known unto everyone. But now that Paul has made it through to us and we've trusted it, it's our responsibility to make it made known to someone else. It's God that said it to Paul. Paul got it. Paul taught. Now he taught us. It's written in a book so we can get it. We're the third down with God, Paul, us. And it's up to us to show and tell and explain. If you don't know these simple, basic things that I'm talking to you about today, and this is totally simplistic, you need to study this, this video 
so you can sit down and explain it to someone else. If you've got a, a, a child or a grandchild or a spouse or someone who is just arguing with you like crazy, I don't believe this, learn this. So you can just break it down into simple terms so they can get it. They're going to reject it. But show them and answer questions for them. How can you answer questions if you don't even know how you're saved in the first place? Mm -mm 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 -mm. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Let's go to verse 25. Paul says, Whereof I am made a minister. Well, thank God. According to the dispensation of God, which is given me to you. And there's a reason. To fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. He filled up the word of God. He fulfilled the word of God. Let me say that. In Ephesians 3.8, let's check it out. Ephesians 3.8. Paul says this, Unto me, talking about himself, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Say, we were not in no covenants of promise like the Jews and the Greeks in the synagogues. Unsear unsearchable riches of Christ. But when he said he was the least of all saints, why would he say something like that? Because he was a murderer. He was injurious. He was a persecutor of that way. He was a persecutor of the little flock. He thought he was doing good. And you know what? There's millions of people in the pulpits today, not in the pulpits, but in the, in the congregations today, in the churches all over America, that believe they're doing good. Just like the Apostle Paul thought he was doing good. They're not because they're ignorant. Now, Paul at the time thought he was doing the will of God, but he didn't recognize Jesus Christ as being the Messiah. But when the risen Savior spoke to him on his road to Damascus, that changed his direction in life, and it changed everything. And then it, it, through him, it let us know that we can be saved. The same way as those Jews and the Greeks in the synagogues. See, we were without God, without hope in the world. There was no hope for us. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 13, 10, 11, and 12, I'm sorry, and 13. Now, let's read Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8. All right, did we just read that? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 3. Verse, verse 1, we've, we've already read this one, but I'm going to read it again. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. He's talking about ungodly Gentiles. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Well, that mystery, a couple of things. One is that we could be saved into the same body and that we could be saved at all. Wow. So forgiveness before the dispensation of grace was what? It was according to the law of Moses. The law of Moses. See, many, many, many people, they, they make the mistake, of, the mistake of going back to time past to the law of Moses for their doctrine of forgiveness. Oh, they do. Mm-mm-mm. But you know what? Instead of going into that right now, I think we're going to stop. But before we do stop, I want to go over what Ricky uh, brought up here. And uh, this... this <laughs> Boy, what it is, it says, Good Ship Missionary Baptist Church, Millbrook, Alabama. Reverend Dr. Derwin V. Perry, Pastor. Reverend Doctor. And what it is, it's, it's something that's an envelope where you can take 
and you send your money up to this guy, your tithes, your offerings, one son, and you've got something here. If you, other than your tithes and your offering, that's two different lines. You've got one line for the building fund, which we need to start here. All service day, you get to, there's money out there for that. A visitor, for the revival, you need to put some money in there for the revival. Uh, youth day, hey, they need money. The church anniversary, you need to put money in. And then if there's any other category, you can check it and write it in of what you're giving for. And then the total of all of it added up. Good Ship Missionary Baptist Church in Millbrook, Alabama. This is this is a common thing. This is a common thing. You go to a church, but I've never I've never quite seen that many different types of offerings. Wow. <laughs> yes, Jay. <laughs> Did y'all hear that? So Dave said that, and Irma said that, that Irma would get one of these from Olive Baptist Church yeah, in the mail. Once a month, you'd get it with all four, you know, for each week. So you wouldn't have to fill it out at church. You could do it before you went. So. Oh, convenience, I guess. Yeah, they send you a bunch of envelopes for all yeah, really. I won't send you one. Yeah, we don't care. <laughs> I don't care if you throw up or not. <laughs> Dave's going to start sending out our envelopes, okay? Or, or you can do it like the Catholic Church. Uh, send them a letter. Well, let's wrap it up, guys. Let's take a break.